In the Karen Reed case, police officer John O'Keefe's body was found unresponsive in the front yard of Brian Albert, another Boston police officer, yet Brian Albert never came outside to see his fellow officer lying unresponsive in his front yard. There's conspiracy theories that the police might be behind this, and it doesn't help that they're taking evidence samples of blood in red Solo cups. Was this an accident or an inside job? I'm Lainey Long. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. And the Karen Reed case has people completely split on one side of the spectrum or the other. Is she guilty or is, are the cops trying to hide something? Did they have something to do with this? How did he not know that this whole thing happened outside his house? This is getting really messy right now. As we record this podcast, we're at the end of week number two of testimony. A number of police officers went on the stand again, as well as uh, other members of the Albert family. And if you've been following it, that's uh, the family of uh, Brian Albert, who owned the home uh, in Canton, where John O'Keefe's body was found unresponsive in the snow, January 29th, early, early, early morning hours of 2022. Uh, by his girlfriend Karen Reed, they'd been out. Uh, they'd been out uh, drinking the night before. She dropped him off, and uh, he was found the next morning. And what happened in between is the issue that's going on in this trial. A lot of different witnesses in this uh, second week as we record this podcast, and uh, the mystery deepened. And um, a lot of observers are saying it's odd that so much. Um, reasonable doubt is being raised during the Commonwealth's own case. And that is uh, kind of unusual, uh, but it, we're trying to keep an open mind uh, on our channel uh, and we're going to reserve our final judgment as to how we feel about it until the very end. I said that last week. Um, Karen Reed is entitled to a presumption of innocence like all um, people that stand accused of crimes. Um, one of the key witnesses this week was the Canton Police Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, who was said to be the senior officer on the scene. Uh, he testified, uh, telling the jury how he removed layers of snow with a simple leaf blower. Uh, it's me uh, operating the leaf blower and at the scene where uh, John O'Keefe was discovered. See, it's, uh, it removes the snow. I was removing the snow layer by layer. And right here, <clears throat> you can see it exposing the cocktail glass. You're going to see red spots appear <clears throat> as I remove it layer by layer. These pink spots start to turn to be dark red spots. Yeah, and so the cocktail glass that he is talking about right there, that is the cocktail glass that John O'Keefe is said to have carried out of the waterfall bar uh, the night before. So he walks out of the bar uh, with a glass, and some people commenting this week said, well, geez, is that what you guys do in Boston? You're allowed to, you're allowed to walk out of a bar with a, a – no. No, no, that's – no, you're not – the law specifically prohibits that, but, you know – that's what happened. And so you know, he's a local celebrity. He's a police officer. Who cares if he walks out walking, drinking in public with a martini glass or some cocktail glass? <laughs> Yikes. OK. And so then after that, um, under cross-examination by defense attorney Alan Jackson, Lieutenant Gallagher, again, the senior officer on the scene, said that he did not write a report on his activities there. Again, even though he's the senior officer on the scene. Did you ever write a report about your involvement on the day at the scene? No, I did not. Okay. So that's not documented, at least by you, that's not documented anywhere? That's correct. Did you take notes uh, when you were at the scene? No. Did you go back to the station and memorialize your findings and your conduct at the scene by taking notes back at the station? No, I did not. So you have no notes and no report about anything that happened at Fairview on the 29th. Not myself, no. So he's the senior officer, a lieutenant. That's a high-ranking officer in the poli any police department. 
he goes to the scene. He's got a leaf blower, you know, removing layers of. Do you ever, do you ever watch um, CSI or Forensic Files? <laughs> yeah. you know. It's usually, you know, at least then on TV, handled a little bit more delicately than this was handled. I've, ne I would I've say. never seen a leaf blower or a uh, solo cups. What the solo cups are all about right now, what you're seeing is a. Uh, picture of the blood stains that were in the area where John O'Keefe's body had been found. And there are blood stains uh, in the snow. And so what they did, they testified on the stand that they found a neighbor with some red solo cups. Do you have, a, you have your cup over there? <laughs> you know, we have some right here. And that is precisely what they used to collect these blood samples uh, in the, on the scene of this crime. And uh, not only that, they then uh, took the uh, samples back to the Canton Police Department in a stop and shop bag. And they put the uh, the paper. I don't know where you get paper uh, grocery bags yeah. anymore, but they found a paper stop and shop bag. They put it on the floor of the police department next to a rag and uh, the vehicle that uh, was Karen Reed's vehicle. And Lieutenant Gallagher, of course, was asked a few questions about that reality. Would you agree that having unsealed and unsecured blood next to the right rear portion of the SUV is a recipe for cross-contamination? If I, you want me to speak to, if I could speak to this incident alone? That's a yes uh, or no question. Do you think okay, that's it's, a, it's not yes or no, but you, for your purposes, I, I would say yes. Okay. And in fact, could even be worse, for, for instance, not just inadvertent cross-contamination. If somebody wanted to touch something on that bag, on those cups, and then touch the vehicle, they could easily do that with that juxtaposition of the open blood next to the back of the, the rear of the car. Objection. Sustained. And so, you know, that was uh, the lieutenant's testimony. And uh, again, um, if you follow criminal cases or watch CSI or forensics files, and I'm not saying they are the be all and end all, certainly not. But the way that the evidence was handled in that case, uh, certainly, uh, if nothing else, raised some eyebrows. Now, uh, Canton Police Sergeant Sean Good supervised the PD's overnight shift on January 28th and 29th of uh, 2002, and he was listed as the primary investigator on the state police report, which is called a CARS report, and that stands for Collision Analysis and Reconstruction Session. Now, you would think that any veteran police officer would know that, uh, Good was on the scene where John O'Keefe was found, but when he was shown the CARS report, which is what it's known as in Massachusetts, when he was shown the CARS report, he really kind of backed away from the whole case. Do you recognize what this is? Looks like some for, uh, state police form. Okay. Is it a, uh, a... Why don't you not ask him? He just answered what he thought it was. You know, and the judge is uh, intervening quite a bit here. I mean, you know, the 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 um, Alan Jackson, uh, one of Karen Reed's attorneys, is cross examining this Canton police sergeant, and he's really backing away from the whole thing. He doesn't even know what a car's report. Oh, come on! And um, she's kind of helping, in my view, the witness balk at answering the question. I do want to point out uh, some things. Thing number one that stands out to me right away is the videography, despite the fact that it's constantly shaking, seemingly, is still infinitely better than the Koberger case. Just mm -hmm. pointing that out, even though we're handling the camera yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, how are we supposed to believe that the people inside the house didn't come out and didn't know what was going on? Where did the cops get the stop and shop bag and solo cups from? That is from, weird. From the neighbor. They got from it from the, the neighbor. neighbor. Yeah, they, 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 they got it from the neighbor. They just happened to have a forensics uh, expert living next door. But the point you just made is going to come up in two minutes, not even about <laughs> the fact that uh, Brian Albert didn't come out of the house when John uh, O'Keefe, the uh, Boston police, his fellow Boston police officer was um, 
lying unresponsive in his front yard. So let's get back to the Canton police sergeant kind of backing away that he doesn't even know what this police report is. Are you familiar with a collision analysis and, analysis and reconstruction section, a CARS report? I know that the state police has a CARS section that handles um, motor vehicle homicide. Um, Does this appear to be a CARS report? I've never seen one. There's, uh, you just showed me one. I'm not in the state police. Okay. So a local police officer in Canton has never seen a collision analysis report. I mean, uh, as a personal injury attorney, we see these all the time. I mean, there's a horrible crash. There's a terrible crash. Uh, and your client is injured, hopefully not worse than that. And uh, you send off to the police and you get this report. And it's very detailed. It's it's done by collision analysts and experts. And they do measurements and they take out the tape and they take a, a zillion photographs and uh, then they uh, write out what happened. And it's, you know, it's a very detailed, meticulous kind of a thing that is done by a unit of the Massachusetts State Police. And the only thing I'm going to say is that for a local police officer to say he, he, he really, you know, is not that familiar with it. I guess raising my eyebrows is enough. I won't finish the sentence. Uh, but you, you did see that your name is listed in the paragraph that I pointed out to you? Sure. Uh, and you're listed as Sergeant Sean Good, that's you, correct? Mm -hmm. Of the Canton Police, who are assigned as the primary investigator in this reconstruction. Because I wrote the offense report from that day? Well, I'm just asking you. I'm dealing with a state police report that lists you as the primary investigator with regard to the reconstruction. Jackson, Your Honor. May we approach? Sustained. Um, sure. Why don't you all come up for a minute? Bring that, please. Sergeant Good wasn't the only uh, police officer that was really reluctant to um, give an inch uh, to the cross-examination by Attorney David Yanetti and uh, by Alan Jackson. He wasn't the only officer that was uh, reluctant. I mean, that's I guess that's just par for the course. But wasn't your question just a minute ago, um, what about the fact that uh, Brian Albert never came out of the house? Okay, that was the next question. While you were there, Remember here, Sergeant Lank asked Brian Albert when he learned that John O'Keefe was lying on his front lawn. Objection. Sustained. You knew that Brian Albert, as a Boston police officer, is a first responder, correct? Yes. All police officers are first responders, correct? Yes. You know from your training that all police officers have to receive CPR and other necessary training to be first responders, correct? Yes. Uh, at any point in time, did you ask Brian Albert why you didn't come out of his house? No. Um, did Sergeant Lank in your presence ask him why you didn't come out of his house? Objection. Sustained. Isn't that an interesting point that um, not only uh, would Brian Albert have been a Boston police officer, by the way, now he's retired uh, and moved away from the house and gave up the dog that allegedly bit um, John O'Keefe. But isn't that an interesting point that not only is he a police officer, but he is, of course, by definition, a first responder and all first responders, Boston police and others are trained in CPR. So he's notified that um, John O'Keefe is lying unresponsive in his front yard. He is by trade a first responder. He knows CPR. He doesn't come out of the house. Isn't that odd? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things you said is that they're doing a really good job at painting reasonable doubt. And I think even before this trial even started, Massachusetts was so divided that all of this just reflects so badly. So the final question that Sergeant Good was asked was, and, you know, because other police officers testified that they heard Karen Reed uh, say, oh, I hit him, I hit him. And then on cross-examination, they didn't stand up so much. So um, Sean Good, who was on the scene for some while, was asked, did you hear her say that? While you were on scene at 34 Fairview for an hour and 40 minutes, did you ever once hear Karen Reed say, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. I did not. Uh, and you wrote a report regarding this, correct? I did. 
who are trained over your 18 years that you include every important detail in that report, correct? So he said that he never, and this is telling because he was one of the senior guys on the scene, if not the senior guy on the scene, and he never heard Karen Reed say that she had hit him, and it's not in his report. So that is certainly grist for the closing argument in this case. If these, you know, these officers contradict one another on the on the point of whether or not uh, Reed admitted doing anything on the scene of the accident. Correct. Certainly, a statement by Karen Reed screaming out, "I hit him! I hit him! I hit him! I hit him!" would have been an important detail that you would have included in your report. Correct. Yes. You do not intentionally admit omit, I should say, any important details from your report, correct? Correct. You did not include that language, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, in your report, correct? Correct. And the reason you didn't include it is that you never heard those words come out of Karen Reed's mouth, correct? Correct. So it is hard to believe that this trial is going to go on. They, they're they saying six to eight weeks, and it's moving really excessively slowly. I'm trying to maintain my law practice, but um, I've been watching as much as I can. And the prosecution is in excruciating detail going over the background of all of these witnesses. And yes, you lay a foundation. Yes, you ask some opening questions to the witness if for no other reason than to make the witness feel comfortable in the witness stand, to introduce them to the jury. You married. What do you do for work? You know, that kind of thing. But the, um, the um, introductory questions just seem to be tedium to me. They go on and on and on. And uh, it's just uh, it. the prosecution seems to be drawing this out as much as they can. And I don't know if I was a juror, which I'm not at this point, two weeks into the trial, I would be saying, where's the evidence? No, we're not seeing any. They, they saw brief pictures of the back of the car with a tail light missing. And they're hearing that at least one of the officers, the officer on the scene who called the Massachusetts State Police to come in, called them and said, this guy has a head injury, may have been in a fight. And so the jury has got to be scratching their heads saying, what is going on here? This is this is the state's case and already some probable causes, you know, percolating up. And um, in his opening arguments, um, David Yannetti and um, Alan Jackson said, it's the state's turn now. The state has their case and they've got to prove everything beyond a reasonable doubt. Just wait. Just wait for us. And those were his exact words. Wait for us because they have a case. They haven't even gotten to um, put their case on yet. And they're they're doing a pretty good job punching holes in the um, state's case. So it's going to be a long trial. But it, in Massachusetts and I think the rest of the country is watching it only because it involves you know, a, uh, a somewhat attractive middle-aged college professor and financial analyst, Karen Reed, who we see on the screen, and police officers and these allegations of a cover-up. And in fact, uh, Turtle Boy is has been covering this. They're letting him in the courtroom. But in fact, uh, the end of the week, at the very end of week two, they threw him out for some of the major witnesses. There was a there was a motion and Turtle Boy's attorney was furious because the AP, the Associated Press, had gotten notice. Uh, but the attorney didn't. He just happened to be in court on another matter in another case. And he was furious. And he he told the judge he was furious. And what what is the Commonwealth trying to pull here uh, by throwing uh, Turtle Boy out of the court without him even, you know, no, without the attorney even getting notice? So they were not they were not happy. Uh, and Turtle Boy the judge allowed Turtle Boy to stay for the case, but not for the following witnesses. And then got out a list of witnesses, which included, by the way, all the Alberts. And so, <laughs> you know, this case is a case that's going to continue to give for the next uh, six or eight. Well, the, if the trial is going to go six or eight weeks, we've got another four to six weeks. I, as you know, we're going to see what happens, but I feel like the, prosecution lost as soon as the red solo cups were brought up i feel like that just looks so awful the sop and shop bag i think that the defense started off very strong originally and i think that you know obviously we're gonna 
try to be jury and we're going to try to be unbiased in the court. But at the same time, they're people and people are biased towards people that have a presence and like you said it kind of feels like they're dragging out the introductions on the on the state's part and i don't know it just looks really bad right now in my opinion and we're gonna see how this plays out oh it is excruciating just to to watch um the witnesses you know ask for their full and complete resume and going way back years and years and years and again it's something that all trial attorneys do you've got to make the witness you know feel comfortable in the stand because going into a courtroom with you know you know a whole courtroom full of people staring at you uh, and the jury is like who is this person we've never seen this person before and you know when you meet somebody you want to you know introduce yourself we have them introduce themselves and so but this has just gone far beyond that uh and so uh who knows who knows what surprises lay in store but um the um defense has promised you know that they will uh, raise a case the defense has promised that their witnesses will bear out their view that um the whole thing is a fix and that Karen Reed is innocent. And certainly uh, on our podcast, we always say in all of these cases that we have, that we are more than happy to allow um, our um, the people that are facing criminal charges uh, be entitled to their uh, right to a presumption of innocence. So this trial is going to go on and it's going to continue to uh, grab the attention of a lot of people. It's being tried in the um, Norfolk County Superior Court in Dedham. And um, again, like I said last week, and maybe we should do a sidebar on this sometime. This is the uh, courtroom. This is the courthouse in which Sacco and Vanzetti were tried and then put to their deaths for being anarchists. So none of us were alive then, uh, but that's that's the history. Any closing thoughts, Laney? No, thank you guys so much for watching. I want I'm definitely looking forward to hear what everybody thinks, especially if you're from the New England area, whether it's Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, wherever. I it's interesting to see how divided the whole everybody is about this. And I'm interested in seeing what people have to say about that. Thanks again for your comments. As I always say at the close of the show, be polite, be respectful, whether you're in the grocery store or the parking lot, you know, you don't know what the other guy is going through. And so, you know, be polite and respectful to people. The other thing is in your comments, be polite and respectful. And the only couple of rules that we have are those. And we don't want you to, you know, personalize the thing. Uh, we got a great comment last week that went on and on and I didn't agree with the thing and they didn't agree with me, but they were specifying why we're all wrong about the Kohlberger case. And I would have left it up until the very last sentence. They personalized it. So click, mm. please. You know, we, we love comments. We love you to tell us how you feel. And if you read through our comments, there are a lot that disagree with us and tell us that, you know, this is why we think that. But if you personalize it, yeah, not so much. So thanks for joining us. Please comment, share, and subscribe. And have a great na- night. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney Myers. Dot com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions.
And that's that. And that's that. No tunnels. No tunnels in Massachusetts. That's a different case. There are, oh, Lots there, of tunnels in Massachusetts. There are tunnels. I mean, the old MBTA uh, has tunnels. and uh, They have horses. There's tunnels. There's horses. Massachusetts is out of control. Oh, boy. This is this is quite a case. Uh, people are following it all over the place. Um, it's tops in the news here. It's been in the news for a long time. I just, you know... I just uh, trust and hope that uh, Karen Reed will get the justice that she deserves. I've, I've tried to keep an open mind about the whole case. I've tried to keep an open mind. Um, I really don't know. I can't say I wasn't there. Uh, but it's the prosecution's case is interesting. It's interesting. And maybe they'll pull a rabbit out of their hat. I do not know. But... Um, one of the uh, people I saw commenting about the Karen Reed case was uh, saying, uh, you know, he's a longtime defense attorney in Boston. He's saying, I've never heard of solo cups being used to collect blood samples. Oh. And we shouldn't be laughing, but it's all right. The whole thing seems messy. The whole thing just seems like it wasn't professionally handled. And I think that's going to end up really negatively impacting them. I don't know. Okay, coming up in the near future, we will have another episode on your comments. Have a good one. Bye.